Welcome to the Zone Informer Podcast. I am your host, Alfred Tabax, joined today by the one and only Nathaniel, as always. How's it going, everyone? So today, uh, there's really not a lot of news. In fact, there's really no news. Uh, the only thing that we could consider news was the official announcement from Nintendo of Japan talking about their Universal Studio plans, which were still very vague, um, but we hit on what we'd like to see last week. Um, if you didn't give that podcast to listen... Um, it went up pretty late because of a lot of technical difficulties, and there's only an audio version because of some video problems, but go check it out. Um, this week, finally hit a really long fan topic that we got a while back um, from Mythosaur Hunter. <laughs> um, we got this back in September, uh, September 21st, actually, um, and then he sent us another a follow-up one. Um, so I'm going to read this. This is really long, so stick with it, um, really? and then we'll talk about it and give our own opinions on what he said and what, uh, a response to what he said. So starting off, <clears throat> I looked for the podcast email in the description and couldn't find it, so I tried the website, looking for the contact info. Unable to find it, I listened to several podcasts uh, and only heard and only heard that there was an email address. Finally, in an old podcast, I found the address, so I tried Zelda Informer Podcast at gmail.com, which got me through to Adam, who obviously isn't with us anymore. Then I Facebooked Zelda Informer. After not hearing back from them for several days, I again asked if this was... If this was the right place to contact the podcast, they sent me this email. So shoot, I hope this is right, and this is the correct podcast. That in case was you guys me. Are wondering, <laughs> yeah, it's podcast at zeldainformer dot um, If you have any questions that you want to send, um, so recently I was considering Breath of the Wild and contemplating the classic callback to the Legend of Zelda with Link looking over out over Hyrule from a mountaintop. It got me to thinking. I love the two D Zelda games. The feel of these nostalgic games accomplishes something that the three D games can't just as the 3D games exhibit qualities that aren't possible in the 2D games. Then came to the realization, we've seen our last 2D Zelda game. The Minish Cap preceded closely by Four Swords Adventure is likely the last fully 2D Zelda game that we'll see, Tingle Games notwithstanding. Sure, there'll be tweaked iterations of the classics and virtual console releases, but as far as new 2D Zelda games go, we probably aren't going to get any more. This saddens me, but Zelda will continue to evolve with the gaming culture and grow from its humble roots. So the 2D games are a work of art just as much as the 3D games are, and ought to be looked out for inspiration as we continue to move on. Here then is the question. What things should Nintendo carry over from the 2D games as that world comes to a close? I've made a list of 10 things that I want to see make it into the 3D games to give you an idea of what I mean. Could be an interesting fan topic for the podcast. Um, so here he's going to go through 10 things that he wants to see um, in later Nintendo games, and then I was thinking that Nate and I would talk about what he said, and then maybe even give us some our own opinions about what we'd like to see in later Zelda games. So honorable mention the shovel. This one doesn't count for two reasons. It was in Phantom Hourglass, which is a 3D-esque, and Skyward Sword had the digging mitts. The mitts were okay for Skyward Sword due to its more whimsical and less serious nature, but imagine Link using a shovel in Ocarina of Time or Twilight Princess. It just seems more visceral, doesn't it? Need some quick cash and a rare chance to obtain a silver rupee? Shovel. Followed a treasure map to the X? Shovel. Fishing and need a worm? Yeah. 10. Magnetic gloves. Give it a chance to strip a sword from an enemy. Use it to push or pull metal items. Make them more awesome than the iron boots by letting Link traverse walls and ceilings with his grubby mitts. Plus, they look styling. Um, and we actually have some form of magnetic gloves, don't we? In uh, Breath of the Wild, Nate? Uh, not gloves. They're like... It's it's, it's, some, it's, it's like a, a magnetic it's a, it's a rune ability that you yeah. use through the Sheikah Slate that is basically a giant magnet. Yeah. So... So we, we kind of have those, um, in a way. I don't know if it can do all the things that he's you saying. Want, you can but... levitate with it. You can't, like, connect your, like, crawl on things with it, but you could do that in that one dungeon in Twilight Princess. Yeah. Um, the Goron so, Mines. With the boots, yeah, the iron boots. Um, none. Number nine. Music from the Adventure of Link. The Adventure of Link. Skeletal role-playing system, less fun side-scrolling platform gameplay, annoying unbalanced difficulty, and I'm going to get a lot of hate for it, but it's my opinion, and I respect anyone who can enjoy the game. Um, but trapped behind the less favorable aspects of the game is a soundtrack unique amongst Zelda games, being one of the few games that Koji Kondo did not score many tracks, though not quite as inspired as Kondo's work, have a unique flair. The Adventure of Link could certainly use some love these days. I would love to hear a few cues from this game, make it into future titles. Uh, eight, Sabrosia. Uh, most Zelda games have a sense of duality, second quest, alternate world, and Oc Oracle of Seasons is no exception. Sabrosia, however, is no second quest or even an alternate world. Sabrosia was a totally different environment connected to the world in which Link's adventure takes place. Sabrosia is to Hyrule what Solstenheim is to Skyrim, 
and like Solstenheim, Sobrosia is very different in climate, temper, and feel from Hyrule. It also takes place on an island overcome by volcanoes and inhabited by tiny sentients. Skyrim's starting to look like a copycat, but I digest. I think he meant digress, but... Uh, <laughs> he digests it. He digests it. It's the idea that I'm talking about. It doesn't actually have to be Sobrosia. The important thing is that there's an entirely separate and foreign world to explore beneath the overworld. This expanded the game without feeling like an excuse to add hours to the playtime. Sobrosia also allowed for a veritable fast travel or warp without resorting to a system of magic to get you from one place or another. Number seven, seasons. Not that Link should be able to control the seasons again, but how about an actual progression? Breath of the Wild is the perfect opportunity. Even something as simple as a switch in the menu, not that I'm suggesting that, would be awesome. Remember how the seasons changed in the fishing pond in Twilight Princess? It looked beautiful, and distinct seasons add an ambience unattainable by games without it. The day and night cycle that started with Ocarina of Time was a good place to begin, and now it's time to drop rays, leaves, snow, and cherry blossoms. 6. Moosh, Ricky, and Dimitri. Another wonderful innovation for the 2D Zelda games also occurred in Oracle of Seasons. Added as more of puzzle aspects than vehicles, mobility are the trio, trio of independently exclusive companions. Now, I would love to traverse Hyrule atop a crippling, cripplingly cute blue flying bear, but to avoid stealing the spotlight from Epona, they should probably be mostly useful for accessing several areas, the overworld, or as a part of certain puzzles. Instead of being two-dimensional characters, however, as Epona has been pigeonholed, each can communicate with Link and has unique talents, stories, and options. 5. Races, Parishians, and Picori. I decided to group these two together as we could go on and on about what races to bring to the next generation. Alright, no more Oracle things for now, for a bit. It's just that the games are so rich in style. Alright, one more thing from the Oracle games for now. This time it's the Parishians. The skeletal scalawags sail a tunneling ship from place to place and apparently quite friendly to other races, making them the perfect candidates for a 3D makeover. Just like several of the previous ideas, the stuff that Nintendo will bring itself itself will bring these ideas to 3D as they were designed by Capcom, but it doesn't hurt to hope. Anyway, the picture 3D rendered Parishians either as a badass undead in a Twilight Princess-ish realistic setting or as a crew of roving jolly specters in the realm of Wind Waker, and the other the Picori. This should be obvious. Of anything that Capcom created, these cute little creatures probably have the best chance of making an appearance in a 3D game. Still not great chance, but the best chance, I think. Even with no interaction at all, it would be the coolest thing just to catch a glimpse of these tiny altruists at work, but only as a child, of course. Number four. Monsters. Octoroks, River Zora, Zolas, and Stalfas that throw bones. That's a mouthful, but I couldn't pin it down to just one monster. Remember how annoying Stalfos were in previous games? You had to trap them in a corner to use a range attack to kill them because every time you swung your sword, the dang things would jump out of the dang way and check a dang rib at you. Now, I don't have a problem with the way Stalfos fight in 3D games. It's a great design, but my heart's cry out to see bones flung from time to time. In the early days of Zelda, Link had but one thing to fear in the deep blue of Hyrule's waterways. That one thing was the Zola, later known or corrected as the River Zora. This beastie was a well-known pest to Link and shot fireballs from its mouth to assault the young boy. What became of this creature of legend? None remain who know. Ha ha ha, I get it. Is an Octorok a purple squid who sits stationary in the water waiting for hapless adventures to wander by? Not in the 2D games. It used to be a land-dwelling octopus, or a skull in Link's Awakening, that hunted you down mercilessly and flattened you beneath a barrage of stones. That I want to find through dimensions. To add more diversity, some Octoroks in Link's Awakening had wings. The Four Sword. This is a tall order, but also likely to happen eventually. Four players split screen 3D Hyrulean action adventuring. I've always been a fan of the Four Swords Adventures multiplayer, so this would be awesome to see move into 3D. It'd be even cooler to do it in the style of Four Swords Adventure, where each level is played individually, connected by an overworld. Split the game into manageable portions so that four people could easily pick up the game for half an hour and put it down at defined stopping points. Although I wouldn't be opposed to Four Swords style game via Zelda, Zelda Maker when and if that's released. <clears throat> Number two is Vadi. This is one. This one is probably most likely out of any on this list to see a 3D rendering. Vadi has the most potential to be a villain, even more beloved than Gearham, and has a fine pedigree in Zelda lore. His inclusion to open the door to all sorts of story and content. The Minish, the Four Sword, the Wind Tribe. Come to think of it, why hasn't he been in Hyrule Warriors? <laughs> he perfectly fits the theme, and it would have been awesome. And hey, if he makes it in a 3D console game, we could see him in the next Smash Bros. The darkness and arrogance he gives off makes us want to defeat him, and after learning what he did to Ezlo, you really want to kick his butt. As long as Ganon doesn't end up being the, his master or anything, Vadi needs to go through D. And finally, number one, the Seed Rings. Here it is, number one, and yes, it's from the Oracle games. I apologize. Moving on, Seed Rings are one thing more perfect in any Zelda game. Uh, one of the more perfect items in any Zelda game. They grow on trees. You had to plant a seed to grow a tree that which would eventually give you a chance of producing a ring, which you then had to take to a jeweler to have it appraised. There was a series of events that led up to being able to use a ring. 
Then there's the vast number of ring effects. Some help you find more rupees or take less damage. Some even transform you. To take, a, take a second to visualize the first gen ring on a 3D game. The uses for rings in a 3D installation would be endless and fun. The rings also gave a way to personalize Link to our playstyle without adding a warmed over RPG system to the mix. Absolutely genius. These rings also gave a sense of accomplishment and reward for the player with unique benefits when they did something extra, I suppose. And when it comes right down to it, all I really want is the expert ring so I can go Little Mac on Ganondorf. And that is that first email. So, Nate, I did a lot of talking because I did a lot of reading. So, uh, you go ahead and, and take take <laughs> some of that and, and digest it, as he said. Um, and give us your opinion on some of the stuff that he said um, and some of the stuff that you'd like to see. So, this topic is weird to me. Now, I've, I've reread this email probably a half dozen times because... There was always, you know, back when I was the, the primary host, there was always, I was going to talk about it this week, and it just, we had too much good stuff happen. Um, so, I am a little torn on the entire topic, uh, because if, if you look at some of the stuff he puts on his list, some of it is mechanics, uh, and some of it is just like a character, or some, or like an enemy he would like to see appear in 3D. Um, and... You know the premise that he presented when he before he gave like his example list here, is that things that are possible in two D uh, but haven't been in three D and things that are possible in three D that haven't been in two D and that two D games are done. Um, you know, with the Minish Cap being the last like true two D game, not the not the last top down Zelda game, but you know the last one that used two D sprites and stuff. So like I, I get where he's coming from. I just don't really uh, it, this conversation is just so difficult to me because everything he presents on his list has either already been done in 3d is being done in 3d or if it hasn't been done in 3d yet it's more so just a wish list of i would like to see this character in 3d yeah um so it's kind of like nothing he actually put on that list is like special and unique to like a 2d game um and, and i think that's what's really weird about zelda over the years is in the past, there was a clear like distinction between this is a 2D, this is a 3D. And you know, some of the big things that helped the 2D top-down styles of the game stand out is you had more enemies on screen at once, and there was enemies on every single screen, whereas when you're in a 3D game, you don't have enemies every time you take a step. Like That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because of the way the world is presented. You can't really have non-stop enemies all the time, or it's Hyrule Warriors. Well, and that would also kill the frame rate of the game, like, yeah. as we saw in Hyrule Warriors. Yeah, so so it's kind of one of those things, like, that is something that's unique to a, a top-down game, uh, because the, there's, there just isn't a good way to replicate that um, that makes a lot of sense, because the world of 3D games doesn't work in, like, those little square box sections. Like, the, like some of the dungeons work that way, but in general, the worlds are a bit more open. Like, not open world, because the games are pretty linear until... Uh, Breath of the Wild, but you know it just just kind of the boxes are so big that you're just not going to get that same experience you do in a top down game. So that's like that's something I think of, you know, from a 2D perspective that isn't in a 3D game. Um, that you know I would like to see them find a way to do it. I just don't know if it's realistic. Um, but you know another thing I used to associate with the top with the, like the 2D games is open world because the only open world Zelda game used to be 2D. Mm -hmm. um, there has not been, despite what everyone wants to say about Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword, like none of these games are truly open world. Um, they're all sectioned off and they're all sending you down the same path. Like if you play the Wind Waker, you're tackling the dungeons basically in the same order every single time, you're getting the story unlocked in the same order every single time. That's not open world, even though you can quote unquote sail everywhere, which you learn early on, you can't sail everywhere, but... Um, eventually it opens up and lets you sail everywhere after you've already completed most of the game. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, to me, that's not open world. Uh, it's the closest a 3D Zelda game has come to be an open world, but that's not open world. And so that was something that I used to associate with the top-down games. Like, The Legend of Zelda, that's, like, the only open, like, truly open world Zelda game there is. Zelda 2 is pretty close, but it's a different type. It's more of an RPG kind of world, um, like the old Final Fantasies and stuff used to be. And then... Uh, also, that a link to the past is probably the other closest, maybe a link between worlds. But again, you know, it still kind of has a set path it wants you to go down, even though it lets you do dungeons out of order. Like, is that what we determine open world to be? You could do dungeons out of order. 
I, I mean, like, that one aspect is what makes it open world. That that just that doesn't seem right to me. Like, I remember in Only Between Worlds, like, yeah, you have that wall merging ability, but you couldn't just go anywhere you wanted, even if you wanted to. Like, it, it just, you had to unlock each section. Um, so, yeah, like, maybe you could do Turtle Rock before some other place, but either way, you couldn't go to Dungeon 9 and do that instead of Turtle Rock. Like, it wasn't really that free. Um, and Only to the Past was really the kind of the same way. Like, you couldn't just go to the Dark World. It didn't mm-hmm. happen. You can't go there until the game lets you do it. Um, and that's kind of the, what I look at as open world games is you can kind of, like, story-wise, there's always a progression, but you can kind of go anywhere and do anything you want. Um, level Well, depending on, like, your level in the game. Like, you could sure do it. Yeah, yeah. Like, it'll be... You might die. It's kind of like what uh, the EJ Anoma set up with Breath of the Wild. Like, after you get off the plateau, yeah, you can go fight Climbing Ganon right now. You're probably gonna die, but you can do it. And like that's that's the thing about open world. Like it's not preventing you from doing it. It's just gonna be extremely difficult, and you're gonna miss out on a bunch of story. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, Breath of the Wild actually feels just as as open world as the original Legend of Zelda, where even more open world than that, since you can do the final dungeon right away or the final fight right away. Um, but you can go, you know, anywhere in the world and discover the story in your own way. And I'm really interested in how they're gonna make that work. Like how they're gonna make it so. One player goes one way, one player goes another way, and when they meet up at the very end of the game and beat the game, they're going to have the same story to tell. Uh, maybe Nintendo doesn't want them to have the same story to tell. But, uh, you know, I, I don't really know how that's going to work. I'm, I'm, that's actually the thing I'm most excited about and most nervous about because Nintendo, no offense to Zelda, they don't do very good with story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they don't do very good with story in any of yeah, the games. So, so just I mean, Zelda them. is probably one of the more complex stories they have, but what makes it complex is the like how bad they are at telling it. <laughs> but, but but Metroid Other M was a really complex story, and 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 it made Samus a very uh, strong protagonist. I liked Other M. I know that's a lot of sarcasm there, but I liked. Other I know. M. I liked Other. M. I the gameplay was fine. I just it it felt. See, I liked the story of, too. I the only there thing a lot of I didn't like that were contrived. Yeah, the only thing I didn't like is it felt. Um, and I know some of it's the lines, but. Uh, Samus's <laughs> voice acting just felt really dry. Well, like that, and like you can't use any of your power ups to go through this place. Why? Because I told you not to. Well, that was the weakest explanation for that. Well, I mean that's pretty much how every video game works ever. You can't use this gun in this level because we just said you can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, but- I'm sorry. You can't use that gun in that level because it's too hot and it's going to overheat. So how about my other guns? Why don't they overheat? <laughs> like, we're digressing. they always give really lame like whenever a game's trying to restrict you to force you to you know use different parts of your gameplay experience like it's all to me i have never seen a good excuse given for why you can't use an item it, it's anyways it, it was bad in that game too like i'm not saying it's good it was bad in that game too um but no like so you know he brings a really interesting topic what do we want to see from a 2d game uh that hasn't been done in a 3d game come to a 3d game like yeah there's lots of characters obviously everyone wants to see Vadi. Um, you know, the Picori, like, there's a whole bunch of, like, races and stuff we could do. I think the Mogmai. Wait, no, we saw those in Skyward Sword. Uh, mm-hmm. So, like, you know, there there's guys that, you know, races you want to see come over, maybe items you want to see come over. But even a lot of the items you want to see come over, some part of the way that item works has already been done in 3D uh, for the most part. So Like you, with the magnetic glyphs. Yeah, like with the magnetic. Like, about. we were just talking about two different ways it's already been done in 3D. All you're talking about is combining that in the one item. Well, they could do that. Um you know, maybe they will. I don't know. But um, none of that really, like, really signifies to me, like, a major thing. Like, any like a player's really going to know, oh, man, that came from a 2D game. Like, mm-hmm. like the, the things that signify a top-down game to me compared to, uh, say, the 3D games is something that really can't translate. Mm-hmm. Because, as I said, the top-down games, things unique to it are things such as the enemies on every single screen, which you're just not going to replicate very well in a 3D environment. Mm-hmm. Or uh, the type of puzzles that work very, very well in a 2D environment but don't really make a lot of sense in a 3D environment. Uh, that's something that's unique to those 2D games, uh, to those top-down games, and you can't really replicate that in 3D. There's a reason you can't replicate that in 3D because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel good. Um, you know, even the way some of the block pushing puzzles work, there's block pushing in top down Zelda games and 3D Zelda games, but they feel different because they have to be different because they gotta they gotta serve the the perspective the, the player has on the game. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things where 
I don't think there is anything more Nintendo can do outside of the open world, which now they're doing, that they could bring from those 2D games that has the that like actually makes sense. Like I, one thing that I would like to see from the 2D game, it'd be more of a mechanic, and it's not necessarily solely sure from a Zelda game. But I'd like to see a level up system kind of similar to what we had in uh, Link's Awakening, or sorry, Adventure of Link, not Link's Awakening, um, where we had like you know every time you leveled up you got more health or you got more mana or something like that Mm -hmm. um i liked that mechanic because it made um it to me whenever you level up from from killing enemies even in a game that's not really an rpg um like a tradition in the classic sense uh, like turn-based rpg um it gives you a sense of accomplishment and again that's i think that's one of the things the new uh, Mario games are missing. Uh, Paper Mario games. It's like when you when you kill an enemy, you get experience and you level up, and then there's a reward for that, um, and it feels good whenever you level up because you accomplish something. Um, and I think that that would be a cool thing to have. If it, it was in any game, it'd be in Breath of the Wild. Um, but we're seeing that there's like other ways to increase health and probably magic that isn't through leveling up. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how they handle that. But if there is one thing from a Zelda game, a uh, 2D Zelda game, that I could bring back, it'd probably be the leveling system. And I know a lot of people probably disagree with that, <laughs> well, but I really liked that. Like, like to bring back the leveling system is, is one of the core things that essentially takes this from being an action action adventure game to being an action adventure RPG. RPG, yeah. Um, and, and I know that some people like really want that to happen. Like they want the Legend of Zelda Witcher. Like that's what they want, and that's cool. <laughs> that's fine. Like. I, I don't I, the, the, uh, the Adventure of Link is my favorite Zelda game, so obviously I love the leveling <laughs> system. Um, as much as I know the the person who submitted this topic loathes the leveling system and calls it broken and <laughs> too difficult. Like I, I, I question if you played any RPGs back then because all of them were like that, um, and maybe that's why I'm more accepting of it. Because like, sorry, Final mm-hmm. Fantasy back then was just as hard to level up in. Um, if not more <laughs> if not more Final Fantasy was hardcore back then oh yeah even when you get to the SNES and you're playing like Mystic Quest and Final Fantasy 2 like oh my god games are hard and that, that's, uh, that's part of the appeal of those games um, mm-hmm. and Zelda doesn't really have that sort of appeal anymore uh, in that direction but it'd be interesting to, to bring that back and obviously there's a lot of blueprints for a lot of games that have done it so mm-hmm. you know they could do anything they want um, Zelda has kind of sort of obviously replaced all that with like the heart system you know, you beat a boss, you get a heart, increases your health. Mm-hmm. You know, that's your XP kind of thing. But it, you don't see that progression mm-hmm. with everything you fight. Um, One other way they could do it then, um, instead of health or mana, um, would probably be like what more action RPGs are doing now. And you have like a skill tree. Mm-hmm. Each time you defeat an enemy or sure. you complete quests, you unlock a point to spend in a skill tree. Um, and I know, again, a lot of people, <laughs> like this game's got a lot of hate we just didn't really talk about it a lot from (laughs) people that thought that this game was becoming too westernized with the way that it was Uh um playing uh but that's one of the like i'd really like to see a leveling system and that's a way that they could do it without replacing what their current method is for hearts and mana where you eat certain items or you get heart containers or something like that sure you you have a skill tree like certain um like crafting skill trees or Sure. stamina skill trees or something like that um i think it'd be pretty cool to see that's not really from a 2d zelda game though no. but the leveling system is. yeah 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 well i mean it kind of is because like the the basically it was increase your health or increase your magic like that was it yeah. um and then, and then strength and yeah 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 strength or power but i mean for the most part it was health or magic to be honest if you wanted to beat that game um mm-hmm. and that's fine uh i i think breath of the wild actually approaching this in a very smart way where Essentially, everything about the game's an RPG without leveling. Oh, um, yeah. And I, I, I think, you know, I mean, this is just me from playing the demo and seeing, you know, the footage that we've all seen now. Um, a lot of the sense of accomplishment in defeating these enemies now isn't an XP gain. It's that you got a new weapon. Mm-hmm. And that weapon does X amount of damage. Or you are almost out of weapons, so you need that weapon. Um, and, and I think something I've... I've started to like about breath of the wild that i didn't think i would because i love rpgs i love leveling like it's it's been a staple of my gaming like forever uh is that it feels more organic to me than i thought it would because one thing that was always weird about leveling is that like 
yeah, you start off like, oh, you're this mage, and you're not very powerful, but suddenly, because you killed some things, you're magically more powerful than you were before, as if they gave you some mystical magic dust and sprinkled it on you. Um, it, it It's not very realistic. Like, yes, you get better with practice, but I'm not getting better with practice. I'm getting better by killing things. And if I kill the same Bokoblin the same way a thousand different times, it doesn't make me suddenly more capable to kill bigger enemies. It just means I'm really damn good at killing Bokoblins. But that's not the way XP works. XP is a grind. Um, and even if they make it where you get enough XP or they balance it enough where you're not ever really grinding, so you don't really ever... Like, you're always leveling, but it never feels like you're behind, I guess, if that's the case, uh, where you feel like you have to go out and grind enemies. Um, then, one, some people that are just going around and exploring are going to end up way the hell over-leveled because they're going to encounter more enemies. That's true. Uh, and two, you know, you, you kind of run to that thing, well, well, if it is perfectly balanced and you don't notice it, then what's the point of the leveling anyways? Because um, it doesn't really feel like progression when you're just going to get there regardless of if it says you have a new level or not. Now, I, I do like, you know, skill trees and also, like, I, I understand, like, all that complex complexity that goes with it. That's why I love games like The Witcher. I love even World of Warcraft. I still play that to this day, Legion. <laughs> you know, I, I only get about one play session in a week, but, hey, I enjoy that play session immensely. Um, it, it's one of those things that I've really, really grown an appreciation for these. But, man, Breath of the Wild, something about, you know, and, and I'm not going to know until I get off that plateau and I get to go out and do more. But I mm -hmm. never felt like there wasn't a reason for me to fight this group of, of guys, which is what I could feel like sometimes in Zelda. Like, you know how many enemies in most of Zelda games? I just run by, because what's the point? Yeah. Like, you, there's no real point to kill them outside of just saying, oh, I killed them. Um, whereas in Zelda, because your items are all breakable, because you're always trying to find the new clothes, because you're trying to get to that chest, because you want to go pick that herb, because you're trying to do all these other RPG-like elements, it makes mm -hmm. the enemies feel like they matter. And because of how the enemies interact with the world, which is one thing I really love about Breath of the Wild that I don't think any other game, not even like Skyrim or anything, has gotten right, is all these enemies, like these beast enemies, interact with the actual world itself. Like, they're not on a set pattern. Um, they kind of interact with what's happening around. You know, bees fall, they react to them, you know. They hear a rustle in the wind, they react to it. Like, mm -hmm. it's really cool. And I think because the world feels so organic in how they work... It feels more organic to me that when I kill them, I don't get some mystical number that pops above my head and says, you leveled up, or here's some XP. Rather, you pick up a new item, and you're like, oh, yeah, this item's more badass. Sweet. Yeah. Um, you craft it or whatever. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. And we don't know if there's crafting yet. We hope so. We hope I hope so. so. Yeah. I hope so. But like, it makes too much sense for them, not, especially with things being breakable. Like, uh, mm -hmm. some sort of crafting system to repair your favorite item, I think, would be really cool. Um, especially with all the material you gather. It's got to be used for something besides cooking. <laughs> like what am i going to use an ancient screw for in my meal um anyways so it, it's i don't know you know i'm kind of stuck in this world where i like the way breath of the wild is doing it and i kind of want to see that play out before i'm like you know what put that leveling system in there um because mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it, i'm gonna i'm gonna come out at the end and be like look this game's really really good might be the best Zelda i played but i wish it had leveling because I fought all these mobs and it just got repetitive and I didn't feel like I didn't feel any progression from doing it. Yeah, um, and that, that was, and, and that's probably what you were hinting at. Like, yeah, you, know, you could end up fighting a bunch of mobs and you get no progression because you get the same items over and over and over again that you don't need. You're just leaving them on the ground. Um, but I don't, you know, we don't know. All I know is based on just the plateau, it didn't feel that way. But again, that's the opening area. They're going to make it feel as you know progressive <clears throat> as possible in that area, uh, whether or not that is the way the rest of the world works i have no idea uh um, that's that's one of the things like I, I talked about how um when you defeat an enemy like you get some sort of uh, recompense for it um and i guess that's like that was probably my biggest problem with sticker star and well not my biggest problem there's plenty of other problems with those games with sticker <laughs> star and uh, pa uh paint splash color splash color splash sorry yeah, he hates uh, that game so much that's it's just called paint splash no, i think it's okay i just I th the problem is is you, when you take out the reward for killing enemies um but and this is kind of the same kind of goes in the same vein but uh in a way the, the two games are on a on a similar path the more you use your weapon in in breath of the wild the weaker it becomes and eventually breaks mm -hmm. in color splash you use the cards and then they're gone after each battle Mm -hmm. And what this forces you to do is choose your fights 
because if you get into a fight that you're just wasting cards on, then you lost like four or five cards or however many it takes. Yeah. Um, in Breath of the Wild, if you get into a fight with some moblins for no reason, while you know you could get an extra item, you're also wearing down another item. Um, well, I also, and, I also think Breath of the Wild, like in, in that sort of comparison, I feel like it's almost better than what Color Splash did. No, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you, you get you get another item, you get a weapon, or you get something at the end of it. But my, my point is, it it's it's not as rewarding to just go into a fight with nothing, or with, with stuff, and then kind of walk out with either lesser stuff or nothing at all. Um, and that's, you know, that when you take away a leveling system, um, and again, we, we don't know that much about Breath of the Wild's leveling system, or how, if it has one, if it doesn't have one, or how you progress, um, but when you don't really get a lot of reward for fighting battles, you kind of wonder, well, what's the point in fighting battles? Um, why not just run past the enemies or try to get around them? Um, that was what I found myself doing a lot in Color Splash. Was well, I'm I'm obviously just gonna be wasting cards, and I'm probably gonna get like one back, or I'm just gonna waste cards, and there's no reason for me to keep fighting. Sure. Um, and. The more I fought, the less I felt like, oh yeah, I'm accomplishing stuff. It was more along the lines of, okay, this is just a hindrance now. Yeah. Um, whereas in like Thousand Year Door and the first Paper Mario, even in Super Paper Mario, there was some sort of like leveling system, and you felt accomplished when you beat a an enemy. Um, and again, I don't I don't know how it's gonna work in Breath of the Wild. Uh, yeah. That's now that's the that's thing. Just... Like, I need to get off that plateau because on that plateau, like you could still avoid like enemies and everything. Like you don't. Yeah. You don't have to fight them, but you want to because you have nothing. Mm -hmm. So, like, every mob you fight, you're trying to build up your collection of items, or you're trying to get to that chest and get that fighter rod, or whatever. Like, they they did a very good job of the plateau of giving you reasons to want to engage the enemies. Um, and sometimes it's just as much as... Sometimes it's just to experiment, um, which mm -hmm. I, I think is one thing that, that Breath of the Wild right now has over uh, Color Splash. is like, a lot of the battles, you're not fighting because you think you're going to lose, you think you're going to waste items. Sometimes the fun part of it is figuring out how to kill them without items. Mm -hmm. like and that's what's really cool like in color splash you don't have the cards you're not gonna win it's just <laughs> just the way it is in breath of the wild you can actually beat them if you have no items um and, and you know some of that's because you know, obviously later on you get things like the the bomb ability where you always have unlimited bombs um and stuff like that so like, the game kind of gives you stuff to make sure you can always engage in combat but uh you know just figuring out you know maybe if i push this boulder off this area i can take out all these guys or if i set up these explosive barrels in a certain way and i can get them to explode um I, and like we saw on the jimmy fallon footage. yeah yeah like saw on the jimmy fallon footage like like this that's the way the plateau is it's set up in, in such a beautiful way that you don't ever feel like you want to level because there's mm -hmm. there's too many other ways or reasons to fight these enemies but again that's what color splash kind of felt that way for a while too mm -hmm. and then as you progress through the game you kind of lose that feeling um and i'm, ho I'm hoping that that doesn't happen with breath of the wild but if Breath of the Wild is as big as it's going to be, I don't know how it can't. Like, you know how carefully crafted every area would have to be to pull this off? And mm -hmm. who knows? Maybe it is. I mean, this game's got six years in development. It, you know, five and a half, whatever. It, it, it very well could be that well crafted. Um, and that's what everyone hopes it is. But I I don't think I've seen a, a game that... I don't. I almost think Breath of the Wild is kind of on its own pedestal right now. I don't know that there's any game that's like this that has every RPG element in the world but leveling. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like... It, it's in, it's kind of doing something like I you know everyone's talking about how oh maybe it's not as revolutionary because there's other open world games there's other games that let you make food and that's fine but how many of those games don't have leveling? Mm -hmm. Like all of them do. <laughs> so so it's really be really interesting to see if they can keep my interest the way they did in that in the plateau area throughout the mm -hmm. whole game in terms of enemy mobs or if it's gonna be like in Wind Waker where I'm just sailing by them or I'm just rolling by them because I don't really care. Yeah, and that you know it, it'll be interesting to like you said how how they keep you engaging enemies, um, and want to engage enemies because after a while, kind of it was kind of like in Skyward Sword achievements. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, it was kind of like in Skyward Sword where you're like, oh, this is a neat mechanic. Like they they change their weapons and I have to adjust to, you know, where I need to hit them, and that's kind of cool. But it was cool for like the first dungeon. Yeah, you're and only really fighting like, them if you have to. <clears throat> yeah, that's like oh, I really don't want to fight them because I have to like wait for them to change their attack pattern or where the way they hold it. it just you know it it got repetitive and again that's one of the things that we talked about i think last time 
um, was how Nintendo's going to keep these fights from being repetitive. And, and um, we think that we're going to get that from, like, the footage we saw, where sure. there's multiple ways to take on enemies. So you're not always going to be yep. fighting them with sword combat. You can fight them with arrows. Yeah. You could stealth kill them all. Um, you never know. And that's <laughs> one of the cool things. That's the exciting things. And even Reggie said, again, in the Jimmy Fallon footage, he said, well... We've been emphasizing that this game is play how you want to play. Um, and <clears throat> that is something that would be, you know, something that, that it's, it's exciting because <laughs> we're no longer confined to playing, you know, oh, well, you have to rush in and attack them with a sword. It's like, well, you can do all these different ways of playing. Um, and that is something we've never seen in a Zelda game before. Yeah. It's always been pretty straightforward, like, well... This enemy takes this item, yeah. and you have to defi- defeat it this way. But again, um, you know, I, obviously we're way off topic now. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, seriously, like, thank you for the submission. I'm sorry it took, mm-hmm. you know, three months or so here to get to, get <laughs> to it. But uh, when you submit something that long, I mean, we need a good chunk of time to pull off this conversation. Mm-hmm. But um, we kind of steer just back, back to at least that part of the topic. I, I just don't... I guess personally... I don't see anything from the 2D games except some characters that I really want to see come to 3D. I, I, I think what makes the 2D games special is stuff that cannot be replicated in 3D in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I think those games need to continue to exist. Whether or not they're actually 2D sprite games or if they're just top-down Zelda games. Because um, top-down Zelda games basically present to you the same thing. Whether it's 2.5D or you know, kind of sort of 3D like A Link Between Worlds. Um, it was very much a top-down Zelda game that felt like the Miner's Cap and Oracle of Seasons and Ages. Um, so, I, I, I guess, you know, what do we want to bring over? Uh, nothing. Mm-hmm. I, I think they've done a, pretty much as good of a job as they can, and that what makes those games special uh, is just what is unique to that perspective. And unless we get a top-down 3D Zelda game, which... I don't think that's ever going to happen. <laughs> I mean, I look between the worlds, you know, maybe something more advanced than that, but it's never going to be like an actual, like third person perspective, move the camera anywhere mm-hmm. you want thing. So I, yeah, I, I think I'm pretty satisfied with what they've done now. Now that they brought over open world, that was always the one that I'm like, man, are they just afraid of doing open world 3d? Because it's gotta be so huge. It's gotta, um, you know, do a whole bunch of stuff, you know, like, it, it's got to go well beyond... It's much harder to do, I guess is what I'm trying to say, over a 2D mm-hmm. open world game. Um, so it was always one of those things, are they ever actually going to do it? Um, and they are, supposedly. So we've yeah. been promised. This open-air like open Zelda game. So Like I said, for me, the only thing that I really want to take over is the leveling Leveling! System. And the thing is, yeah. that's not even really, like, a 2D exclusive thing. Yeah, it's not thing. really exclusive It's just exclusive Zelda. Zelda 2D. Because that's the only yeah. game we've had it in. Um, and that's the only thing that I'd like to see carry over from a Zelda game. I can um, say, like, you know, maybe this is a, it's kind of a little bit off topic, I guess. You know what I want to see come back? You know, because you, you mentioned the leveling thing and stuff from the 2D games. I would like mm-hmm. to see them create another side-scrolling Zelda game. I know that's crazy. We have... Yeah. Nintendo does a zillion side-scrollers. But... Well, like, we... Did we talk about this before? Because I feel like you, um, you know, Assassin's Creed did the uh, Assassin's Creed China and, and yep, um, those ones where it was like a side scroller, kind of like Trine. Did you ever play Trine? Yep. Um, that's what I imagine that they could do with a chic game. Sure. Um, is something side scrolling, um, where you can kind of stealth, where you where you just go like I, it'd be cool to see like a thief themed sheet game <laughs> but i could also see them do like a t- 2d side scroller like that sure um but it's and... always something that i was like i know it was a, a quote-unquote failed idea but yeah nintendo's really good with side scrollers so i don't know we're getting a pikmin one like yeah if, if, if pikmin can do it zelda's already been there before so <laughs> can it really be worse well it's the pikmin one doesn't even look that bad it just no doesn't, it doesn't it's just not it's just, pikmin 4. it's just not pikmin like i yeah. mean it's pikmin it's just something else taking place in the Pikmin world, but it's not like traditional Pikmin. Um, yeah, for you know, well, well, that remains to be seen how well that game's going to do. I'm probably still going to pick it up because yeah, I, I, that, I think Pikmin. people are less upset about that than the Metroid Federation Force. 
because they <laughs> did get Pikmin 3 on the Wii U. So Yeah. Well, and it's still like Pikmin. It's it's not Pikmin without Pikmin in it. Well, yeah, and the thing is we have, we know that Pikmin 4 is like a thing. Yeah. That exists whether or not it's coming out anytime soon, who knows, but yeah. So, again, thanks for that topic. We got a good chunk of our podcast from it. Figured. Um we've got I'm going to read a few uh, just a few of our other fan topics, and then uh, we'll see how we're doing on time, whether or not we want to push something for next week or keep it for this week. Sure. Um, so, let's see. <clears throat> oh, got to clear his throat. <laughs> Lee Lovelace said, and I think that we're going to agree on this one, um, Nate and I, do you think that Breath of the Wild is a step in the right direction for Legend of Zelda? Do you think it's partly an attempt to expand the already vast... Legend of Zelda fan base by trying something new with the series. Assuming it's well received and like, do you think it'll be a permanent change to Legend of Zelda in the future? If not, do you think we'll see the return of this kind of Zelda game? Um, it's a little difficult to answer that question because they're trying a lot of different things in the game. Um, unless you're referring specifically to the open world or the open air aspect of it. Uh, depending on how well received the game is, uh, this was a really ambitious thing for Nintendo to do uh to make this game and you know emily rogers has even gone on and said that this is quote unquote too ambitious uh but you know, yeah um so if 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 they had a hard time with the open world and that's what took them so long then we might see it again but we also might have a longer time between games especially if they continue to do the completely new engine with each game mm-hmm. um i'd like to see this become the new form for Zelda, like an open world uh, action game where uh, you you kind of get thrown out into the world and you experience a story as you go along. Um, but it's like we've talked about this before. We've talked about it last week. It's really hard to say what's going to become a trend with Zelda because there is no real trend with Zelda. The, all the games kind of play differently um, in terms of their core mechanics. Um, and the core mechanic for this game is the open world. So whether or not we'll see that again is going to be a mystery until we get the next game. Um, and if we get, like, two major Zelda games with the exact same mechanic, then, yeah, it'll probably be, like, the, the new form for Zelda. I'd like to see it be the new form for Zelda, uh, but it's a little too early to call, uh, if that makes sense, um, just so, because we, we don't know. Like, this is what I wanted Zelda to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know... Not just the open world, like all the, everything they're doing in it's beyond what I expected. Um, I think it's beyond what anyone realistically expected Nintendo to pull off with an open world Zelda so far. And I don't think it's going to end up being the future of the franchise as much as I want it to be. Not because the sales are going to be bad. Not because it's not going to bring new people in. In fact, I think this game is not going to bring new people in so much as it's going to bring um, more of the Zelda fan base together for a single game than any game has done since twilight princess uh now that doesn't mean there's not gonna be new people that that this is their first zelda game i think that happens with every zelda game uh but i think that even if this game does well let's let's say it tops 10 million sales which seems to be a number nintendo has been wanting a zelda game to hit forever and just they can't do it um especially on a single platform so, you know, and this game might not even have a chance to do that on a single platform. It's selling 10 million units on the Switch would be better than Twilight Princess on the Wii. So, like, that's crazy to even think that's possible. Um, but, based on Eiji Nomo's own words about Breath of the Wild, he said, yes, he would like to do another game like Breath of the Wild again. You know, maybe one more time. And it's like, that one more time thing tells me that even if this game is awesome, this is an Ocarina of Time. This isn't a link to the past. It's not setting a new standard. They're not going to keep making open world Zelda games. And I think that's... <laughs> that kind of gets into an issue we've talked about before. Where, like, There's no consistency with the series. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to have this massively successful open world game just like they had a massively successful Twilight Princess and they're not going to care. They're going to turn around and do whatever the hell they want. Um, and we as fans just have to kind of eat it knowing that, yeah, someday they'll probably <laughs> do another open world game because Eiji Inomu said he wants to do at least one more um, so it's like, oh yeah, we'll get at least one more. It, 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 it's hard for me to take any single game as being like, this is the new benchmark that's going to set the standards for the series. Because until Nintendo proves it actually wants to stick to something, what is a standard? 
Yeah. Like, even Ocarina of Time, like, how many games deviated from that? You know, how many games deviated from A Link to the Past? Like Even Majora's Mask, a direct sequel, deviated. Like, The Legend of Zelda. Time. Zelda 2 deviated pretty dang far from what The Legend <laughs> of Zelda was. Like, like Zelda doesn't stick to, like, a set path. Like, I know a lot of fans want it to happen. They want it to be, like, you know, like The Witcher or, you know, The Elder Scrolls games. Where, like, you have a kind of a set direction for the type of experience you can expect Every single time. Like, if Breath of the Wild ends up being the highest critically acclaimed Zelda game, it somehow unseats Ocarina of Time, which means it would be the highest rated game of all time. If it does that, even, you're, you, that, it doesn't matter. Because it didn't matter for Ocarina of Time. Th- that's not going to be the future of Zelda. And that sucks, because uh, every time Zelda seems to find its height of popularity, it decides it wants to throw it out the window and do something else. Um, and it's weird because like I like all these experimental games. I like the Wind Waker. I like the Four Swords or the Four Swords Adventures, and you know Triforce Heroes. Uh, you know even Only Between Worlds, which is like the first time we've had a game that far apart revisit a world before. Majora's Mask. Like I like all these games that do things differently, but they also create consistency issues. And I think if Breath of the Wild ends up becoming some sort of new like high mark for the series, which I think is what. I think that's what even you know even Zelda fans that want this game to fail they really don't want it to fail they want <laughs> they want to be proven wrong like they want mm-hmm. they want this game to be like literally one of the best games they've ever played in their whole life like that's what they want they just know in the back of their minds that's probably not going to happen and Breath of the Wild is going to set this bar and I don't know if Nintendo is going to get back up to it anytime soon because they just don't seem interested in sticking with that uniform direction like. All right, this this open world game is great. So now all future three D Zelda games should be open world. I don't see them doing that, um, and it sucks. I want to say I'm confident that they will, but they won't. History shows us with Zelda, it doesn't matter how popular the game is. That's not going to determine what the next game is. Like Ocarina of Time was super successful, so let's release Majora's Mask, which oh they're going to eat because it's the same art style, except you know it sold way worse than Ocarina of Time. It had a time system. It wasn't in high rule. Only had four dungeons, and it was based on its whole mass system. Everything was so different from Ocarina of Time that you know Ocarina of Time players were like, "Eh, you're kind of like the <laughs> like the dumb cousin that doesn't get it. Like you don't get why we like Ocarina of Time. So like, get out of here." Um, and the thing is, like the people who play Majora's Mask love Majora's Mask, but it it was a totally different type of game than Ocarina of Time was. And I think whatever they do next for Zelda after Breath of the Wild, God forbid, it takes another five or six years. Um, which I really hope it doesn't, but if it does, I doubt it's going to be another game like this again. Heck, it could be the, that Wind Waker 2 game. Like, they might go all the way back to that just because they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, like, Zelda is a series that goes wherever the minds behind it want it to go, and I think when they have a world like Breath of the Wild, they put so much into it that the next game after that, they don't want to do that again. And I, th- I kind of get that feeling from what they've done in the past like they don't want to do what they've already done and try to do better at it um which is what a lot of games do like the witcher got progressively better with each game because it took what it did before made it better and added more on top that's not what zelda does um it doesn't take what it did before and add more on top it takes what it did before throws it out the window and tries again (laughs) no regardless um so i a personal desire i if this game is as good as it is is hopefully cracking up to be then yes, I would like to see this be the future of, this, of the series. We're, we're to a point now, handhelds and consoles are being melded together. Uh, there's no reason to necessarily release, you know, even even release top-down Zelda games anymore unless they're just going to have, like, a side team like Rezo mm-hmm. make them. Um, yeah. So, like, that in theory should speed up development, having, like, a single title represent the series moving forward. Um, and I would like to see them continue, even, you know, even if they don't want to stick with the same art style, which I think would be... Uh, I think I'd like to see him stick with this art style, but even if they weren't going to, like just the ideas presented in it, it'd be nice to see him stick with. And I could totally see whatever's next after Breath of the Wild being maybe the most linear Zelda game they've ever made, because they're just going to want to <laughs> go the polar opposite because they're tired of open world. Um, and that sucks. It sucks thinking about that. Well, uh, because maybe. like we waited what thirty years. To get an open world Zelda game again since the first one came out. Who thought in 86 you get an open world Zelda game and you'd have to wait 30 years to get another one? Well, here's the thing. I'd be okay with a non-open world Zelda game on one condition. And that is being... No, no, no. A very story-driven Zelda game. Like, 
really story driven. Not like Skyward Sword story driven where the story's eh, but like a really engaging story. Like The Last of Us? Act. Yeah, with like the la- where, where it's where it's a good story and, and it's it's not necessarily open world, it's like more level based and like you move through it like a film. Um, I know that that's like a pipe dream that's probably yeah, never yeah, yeah. That's happen. That, that's more like The Last of Us or Heavy Rain where yeah, that, the reason you play is the story is not the gameplay. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Nintendo's ever going to do no. that. But that's the only thing I'd be okay with after this yeah, that's what going I'm saying. back like, to a linear. It's going to be really... Because as I've said, I've loved Zelda up to this point. Like every game that's come out, I love it. You know, Even Ocarina of Time that I crap upon, I love Ocarina of Time. <laughs> uh, it's just not my favorite Zelda game. That's just the way it is for a whole bunch of reasons. However... You know, you look at the history of the series, and it's got all these up and down, these dips, and all these new directions, and I love them so much, but maybe it's because I haven't gotten that one game, and Breath of the Wild felt like this at E3, like, oh my god, my eyes are open now. Like, that one game that's like, no, this game is so much better than any other Zelda game that I've ever experienced, that anything else besides something that goes in this direction is going to feel like a lesser game. And I, I feel like that's what a lot of people who lo- who have Ocarina of Time on this pedestal, I think that's the way they feel. I think they feel that it's on this pedestal, nothing's really done anything like it since, so nothing's as good. And I, I am a little worried that that's what's going to happen with Breath of the Wild, for me. But it's Because that's what I felt like at E3. I, you know, I've said this on other ZI podcasts, I've said this on even the Nintendo Prime podcast with Eric, who was at E3 with me, that after I played that demo, Breath of the Wild may already be my favorite Zelda game. Mm-hmm. just the demo area like that could be a game on its own that's how good it is um so i, I really worry about um I, I i guess i just don't trust nintendo like at all and that's the problem with there being multiple like different styles and different forms of zelda games is that you can say that one is better than well you you can and you can't because they're all different yeah and so you're going from uh, Ocarina of Time to Wind Waker. Two completely separate styles. Sure. One's in the ocean, one's on land, one's more open world than the other, one flows slightly seamlessly into the other, um, one's not as sectioned off. Like, they're two completely different games in terms of, you know, how, maybe not necessarily how they play, but their, their core concepts. Um, and it's really hard to compare them. It's It's... It's a little difficult to explain. It's kind of like when uh, we got the question about how to replicate the the Zelda magic and why no other game has done it. Um, it's it's really difficult to describe because all like we said, we keep saying this. All the Zelda games are different, um, and comparing them is like it's kind of comparing apples to oranges in a way, but oranges that are really similar to apples. Sure. Just because they they're 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 very different games within the same vein. Yeah. Um, and they're all Zelda, they're, but yeah, but they all they're all different. Yeah. Like different art style, different gameplay. Um, and whether or not we'll see another one, I'd like to see another one like Breath of the Wild, uh, especially if this game blows me out of the water like I expected to. Um, expectations are really high for this game. Uh, by the way, in case anyone was questioning that, almost every Zelda fan has really high expectations for this game, so it better deliver. Um, but whether we'll see another one. Uh, there's a big possibility we will, um, but there's also a big possibility we won't, just because of trends, but also because of what they've said, that they'd like to do another game like Breath of the Wild. Um, also, uh, I think I might be pronouncing this wrong, I would say Louis Freeth said pretty much the same thing, um, but we had a longer, more detailed question. Sure. Um, so, one thing I want to bring up, um, and you probably aren't aware of this because you're not paying attention to what's happening in our news chat room right now. We actually got some news for Breath of the Wild, potentially. Uh, there was a Mitomo data mine. Ooh, I see that. That provides uh, Breath of the Wild art. Now, I'm not sure how this is confirmed to be Breath of the Wild art um, because I, I haven't closely examined this yet. Uh, but... Um, some of the it somebody said it may be fire emblem yeah like it, it i can't tell like it, it gets i'm wondering you know if the, it's so hard to tell if this i'm trying to figure out what confirms that it's zelda art um is it because well some of the things they uncovered have definitely have zelda in it i mean who knows 
Uh, but if it is, I, I I guess the only thing I can say is like the biggest news that's the map. Mm-hmm. Um, if and, and there are aspects of this that do look like the map, like the island in the middle of that water, that's mm-hmm. that's in the Breath of the Wild map. We've seen that. Um, so if this is like that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Just because like you know maybe we'll throw an image up in the video here, a video version, but it's got like a th- it's got like three land masses. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, the more I look at it, the more I'm seeing things that are from the Zelda map. But if you continue to look at the data mine, the Imager link yeah. looks like a lot of stuff from it's Fire Emblem. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's mixed. It looks like it's a lot of mixed in stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Anyways, it, it's just really cool. Obviously, you know, if this turns out to be something, we'll probably have more to say next week. Uh, once we can figure out what is Zelda, what's Fire Emblem. Um, it's just something that popped up. I'm like, oh man, I wish this popped up earlier so we could have did the research. <laughs> <laughs> and found out what's what so we know yeah. what to be excited about and what's just like ah oh, it's just fire emblem all right cool um mm-hmm. not the fire emblem is nothing i'd be excited about this could be teasing a new fire emblem game mm-hmm. um but anyways uh what's the next fan topic or, or are we moving on to the thing you want to move on to so this is uh, be- just because i don't know what we're doing next week um may have a guest we may not it really depends on if he gets <laughs> seems to be how it seems to be how it is every week yeah <laughs> Last week, thought we had to have a guest. We had an interview, so check out the interview. Yep. Um, but depending on how long uh, this can go, um, since it's it's Christmas time is coming, and in Christmas we get gifts, and we give gifts, but there's no greater gift than the gift of a dream game, at least in my opinion. There's probably greater gifts, but <laughs> um, just for the sake of the podcast, that's what we'll say. So I want us... To talk about what our dream game for the Switch would be. Like, it could be from an already existing series, and you can't say Breath of the Wild. Um, It could be from an already existing series, or it could be a completely new game that you come up on your own with. And I'm going to toss this one to Nate first. Put him on the spot, because I'm just cool like that. This is tough for me, because, like, part of me wants, like, you know, give me that new IP, baby. (laughs) <laughs> give, give it, give me that new game that I don't even know what I want to give it to me, or like there's a game in my head that I really want to, you know, present the idea for. The problem is there is a game in my head I want to present the idea for, but like I'm going to school to make games, so I kind of want to keep that idea to myself, <laughs> so I actually make it one day, um, not really put it out there, especially on a podcast that people listen to. Uh, <laughs> if it was the Nintendo Prime podcast, like yeah, maybe I'll throw it out there then. Um, but no, so I, I think I'm going to stick to. Uh, there is really three franchises I, I, I keep thinking of that I really want to see continue, at least continue in a vein similar to what hooked me on them in the first place. Uh, obviously, the first and most obvious choice for anyone who knows me is is a, a true uh, mana game in the mold of Secret of Mana. Uh, and I know that, that series hasn't completely died. There's like three or four other games. None of them are any good. Um, Secret of Mana is like the pinnacle at least to me, of what an RPG is, an action RPG. Um, and I would love to see a game like that or uh, even, like, retcon the series and just do a direct sequel to it. Um, like that, exclusive to the Switch, in full 3D, uh, or, or, you know, something like that I think would be just epic. Um, I also wouldn't mind seeing uh, another Tales of Symphonia kind of game. Mm-hmm. Um, now the tales, like uh, the, the tales of series, is actually still going. Yeah, I was um, about to say like specifically tales of Symphonia but, or but specifically tales of... T- specifically mm-hmm. tales of Symphonia, something in that vein. Like the, there are other tales games, and I'm not going to say they're bad because they're not. Um, you know, not not the way that I feel about the other ma- mana games. Where I'm like, yeah, those games aren't really aren't that good. But like the other tales of games are good. But the Symphonia direction to me was like the pinnacle of what those games could achieve, it, it, at least for my entertainment. Um, and then the other one is a much beloved game that really no one talks about anymore, and that's Bot and Katos. That game, I think there was a Bot and Katos 2, if I remember, um, was not even close to as good as the original. It was the only, to this day, probably the only card based RPG battle system I liked. What's it called? Bot and Katos. It came out on the GameCube. Um, I can get you a, a, a link to it sometime if you want to look. Or you can just Google it and look it up. Um, it's a very, very good RPG uh, that 
I feel like not even a lot of people played at the time. Um, but to me, it's like one. Of, it, it might even be my like the best RPG on, in my opinion, on the GameCube. Um, and it, like I said, it's the only one that's got a card-based battle system. I I really enjoy, and I didn't feel held back by it. Um, and I didn't feel like it wasn't challenging enough. Ah, uh, okay. Um, very good game. And I would like to, you know, I, I believe that did get at least one sequel, but that's a Monolith Soft game. Yeah. yeah, and that's the thing. Monolith Soft is Nintendo, so like, I, um, I that that's like, oh, in terms of realistic chances, this is the most realistic chance, uh, especially if they want to take a break from what they've been doing, um, mm. and, and maybe go back to some roots here and you know make a game that might be cheaper to make or something. Um, but I would really like to see that come to Switch because, like, the thing is, none of the games I'm suggesting are games that are like gonna make the switch like super super successful but like these are the kind of games that i think uh gamers look back on to be like yeah we had that super mario 64 we had that uh you know that twilight princess that wind waker like we had these big games but like we also had these games in between and these games in between are kind of what you could argue the wii u is missing um you know yeah we have bayonetta 2 which is absolutely fantastic but then what else did we have you know, Devil's Third wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Wonderful 101 was great, but, uh, okay, that's two in four plus years. Like, that's not enough. Um, so, like, these are the kind of games I, I would, you know, I love them a lot. So, like, I'm, a, like, a big niche fan of them. Um, they're all, obviously, within the RPG spectrum, which I love RPGs. And I, I feel like as much as we are kind of getting some RPG love now, uh, like, with the Wii U, you know, we had Xenoblade Chronicles 2. You know, even Breath of the Wild's getting some 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 kind of RPG treatment. I would like, you know, heck, we might be getting Skyrim remastered. Like, Mm -hmm. we're getting RPG love now, apparently, for the Switch. But I would like to see it be uh, some more variety in there. You know, your card-based battle RPG, like Mike Kato's. Your action RPG, um, you know, that's kind of like The Witcher, but since that series is done, you know, that's why Secret of Ana, something in that vein. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. those are are kind of the three titles I wanted to see some sequels to. Um, or, you know, even original games that are kind of just based in those kind of molds. Um, but yeah, that, that's really it for me. I, I know what you said one, I had three, just kind of the way it is. Cause I'm told, I'm literally torn on those. I've been begging for sequels, like good quality sequels on Nintendo platforms for those games forever. So. Yeah. And that's what I said, like games that you want, not necessarily yeah. games that are realistic. Yeah. Um, I mean, mine really aren't any secret cause I talk about them a lot. <laughs> Uh, I mean, obviously, I want a Dark Siders three. Um, we've already gotten one. Yep. We've already got War. We've already got Death. I want to see Strife, maybe. Um, be a or Resurrection female protagonist. Um, there'd be just because at the very end of Dark Siders two, they te- I'm not going to spoil it, but they tease a you know, possible there, third there's, game. Yeah, there's more to tell. Yeah, like it's like there's they, more they, to the story. They didn't plan to stop it at two. It's just the company went under. Yeah. The company went under, and there was supposed to be a third game. And so I'm really hoping that the third game is either a breakout game for the Switch, like it's it's a day one release, or it comes out later on for the Switch. Um, like, that's my hope. Like, I really want that game, because Darksiders is one of those underdog franchises that doesn't get a lot of love, but deserves a third game. Um, just because it's so... The story is so good, and there's it's so well written. Um, and then... I'm uh, really hoping for a true Luigi Luigi's Mansion sequel, uh, like Luigi's Mansion Three or whatever, however you, whatever they want to call it, um, where we see things like portrait ghosts make a return, where each ghost has different personalities and they look different and they react different. And there are different ways to catch them. Um, Luigi's Mansion just, One, basically. Yeah, just 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 like Luigi's Mansion One, take those concepts and improve upon them. Or remaster Luigi's Mansion. Like, uh, that's my favorite game of all time. Like, I, I just want to see it done justice again. Because I was not really a fan of Dark Moon. Um, was there anything in Dark Moon you liked? Um, the music was pretty good. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of the music in the game. Um, I just, the bosses were really bland to me. They were all sure. the same ghost. The King Boo boss fight was eh. Um, spoiler alert, in case you were... <laughs> Uh, that's not even that far into the game i know um it just it it felt it lacked it's the same problem that a lot of people have with uh paper mario is that it lacked the character of the older ones sure. like sticker star didn't have the buddy system or the partner <laughs> system so you miss out on the, all those characters yep. um and so that, that was my biggest problem with that um in terms of like see you, you said three games so i'm gonna <laughs> throw what, some other what, ones out there yeah um 
So yeah, I got Luigi Mansion, Dark Siders three out of the way. Those are obvious games that I'd like to see again. Um, I I'd really like to see. I've said this before too, like a Pokemon Coliseum or XD Gale of Darkness type game come out again on the Switch, um, because those were two games that were really really good on the GameCube, um, <laughs> and especially now that we're joining the two systems together, um, I think that'd be really really cool to maybe like since who knows we might have the pokemon box on there um you can bring over pokemon from your pokemon box into these games um and, and play with them that way I, I have no idea i just i just really liked <laughs> those games i liked how they played i liked the story behind them it was, it was a bit different than sure. what we've got before um and we haven't seen anything from uh who who did that intelligent systems and uh oh my gosh there's one other company that did it it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't Monolith Soft. I have to look this up. It's yeah, bothering me. I don't remember. Um, but those were those were two games that I really really liked. Um, Genius Sonority. That's right. Okay. Um, and I'd I'd like to see more of those. I just like the way they played. I like the battling system, uh, the characters. So basically, <laughs> what I want two out of those three are, are GameCube games that we I'd like to see come. We back seem and, we and seem to keep going back to that era. Yeah, I know. It had such great games. Um. Ooh, oh, a game that I'd like to see. I have another one. A, a, another sequel, um, like a, a true sequel, would be Elibits. Nice, because that choice. was a really good game. The music in that game was fantastic. Yeah, that game's amazing. And if if you've never played that, it was like a release game for the Wii, and it's probably one of the best games on the Wii to be honest. It was fantastic. That was a proof of concept game that worked really, really well. Yeah. Um, if, if, imagine like. If you wanted to play Ghostbusters on the Wii, but like a good version of Ghostbusters, <laughs> pick pick up Elements, and it's it's just really fun. I love that game so much. I need to play it again. Sticking Man. with my RPG theme, I just gotta throw a shout out: Skies of Arcadia. Okay. We need another one. <laughs> this needs to happen. It's not going to, but it needs to. Yeah. Sorry, I, mean, I, I obviously I love what RPG is. I know. <laughs> I just can't. I don't know if I can think of any other uh, games that like like ones that we don't think that we like we don't immediately think that'll be on the the Switch. Obviously, there's gonna be a Fire Emblem, Madden, game, Animal Crossing game. Yeah, you and your Madden. I would love Madden to be on there, so then I can get rid of my Xbox One. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I I can't think of anything else that I'd like to see on there. I mean, those are my dream games that I'd like to see more of. Um, I can't. I so I can many RPGs popped in my head. I'm trying to think of. Uh, <clears throat> Some other I mean, games. We're, we're getting Stardew Valley, which is a yeah, that's you know, true. That's it got pushed to the Switch, which is nice. It's funny that I'm like I want all these RPG things. I don't have time anymore to play these kind of <laughs> games. Like I don't know how I'm gonna find. Like I, it, this is probably the first time in my life I can literally say if it wasn't for the fact that I got paid to cover Zelda, I would not be able to play Breath of the Wild. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I would just not have time to play it. It would not get like I would not even beat the final boss in that game probably for like seven years. I just kids, I just don't have time. <laughs> but thank God that I do. No, like I like I know I have like this Nintendo Prime thing going. I really want Nintendo Prime to make money, just for the sole prospect of I can use the excuse. Hey, I'm, I gotta play this game for review. Gotta play it. <laughs> gotta play it. Oh, the new like and that's what excites me about the Switch thing and Nintendo Prime taking off. Like there's all these games. Uh, maybe I will be able to find time because it's a job now. Um, yeah. Instead of me spending all day writing, I can spend all day playing, and then a little bit yeah. of time writing. I don't have that excuse. Yeah, right. You don't. You don't have. See, if I didn't have kids, it wouldn't even matter. Obviously, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have all this time in the world to play games. I, I know you don't get paid. I don't get paid enough for this. I don't get paid enough for this. It's okay. Um. Yeah. So I, I know I can't even think of any other ex- obscure things. You know, I'd love, I mean, to, I'd love to see a Bayonetta three. I think there's yeah. clear, clearly room for one. Um, Bayonetta two was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh. You know, but I'm not a big Bayonetta fan myself. Not really my kind. It was. Of, it was a really good game. Not my kind of game. I did own it at one point. I bought the the one that came with the first one on it, or maybe all copies came with the first one. I can't remember. Um, uh, only the first few released Bayonetta two up until now hasn't. Okay. Yeah. Because when cause, I bought it new, it didn't have it attached to it. Okay. Yeah. Because when I bought Bayonetta two, it had the first game included with it. Yeah. Um. Which they were. I mean, they were fun. I didn't beat them. Um. I, but I played a lot of them. A, a lot of, of it. I got probably a good ten hours into each game. Um, really, really good games. Just you know, not my kind of game. 
But I don't really have any compl- like if I was reviewing it, I don't really have any complaints. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just you know, not a game that I you know want, feel like I need to finish. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a it's a hack and slash game. Well, it is, it is, but a um, very good one. Yeah, I mean, it's an act. It's it's an action game. A very very yeah. damn good action game that has a very unique premise and theme to it. That um, in today's world is kind of frowned upon, um, but Platinum doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, and, Platinum cared about what people wanted, and we wouldn't have gotten the Wonderful 101. Yeah, and the Wonderful 101 is fantastic. It's very difficult to play. A very difficult. It's got a learning curve. It, it does, and I think that's why people got turned off from it so fast. Yeah. But it is amazing once you figure it out. Like, oh, that game is good. Something that I'd like to see. Yeah, there we go. Uh, another, the Wonderful 102. There we go. Never, it'll <laughs> never happen, but. Ugh. Something that I'd love to have a big presence on, on the Switch would be like a huge indie presence on it. Because I know they kind of tried to push that with Wii U. Sure. But we didn't get a lot of those indie games until like two, three years after they were released. <laughs> like we were just getting Axiom Verge on the Wii U. And that game's been out forever. Um, I'm yeah, surprised. Yeah, a that... lot of the bigger ones that came on other platforms seem to be like, yeah, we'll bring the Wii U someday. Or we'll yeah. can- cancel it now for the Switch. It's like, uh, indie. Th- that's one thing I, I hope indies get... I, Indie developers kind of get a pass on this. Like, this is a, an issue people have with AAA gaming. Like, it comes out on these platforms and it's delayed for another. Um, and people get mad at AAA publishers for it because they have the money to not do that. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to get mad at indie developers. Like, yeah, first I'm going to release on Xbox One. If it does well there, then we have enough money to do it on PlayStation. Then we have enough money. Yeah. Like, I get it because you're limited in funds. But I wish some of these bigger studios that um, they're still indie, very much indie. But they've made enough money now um, where... If you're going to ever release it on all these platforms, why not just do it all at once? Mm-hmm. Well, it's also, you know, like they said for the Switch, the architecture is going to make it easy to port. Well, yeah, I think yeah, that was yeah. one of the problems for the indie games. Like, was... I think Ukulele, um, you know, uh, I presume Ukulele is not coming to Wii U anymore. Not anymore. Um, I don't, I don't, it's not coming out until what, next year or the year after? I don't even know. Um, I have no idea. And with the Switch out, I don't know why they wouldn't cancel the Wii U version, just do a Switch version. But if yeah. they do, I have a feeling it's going to release at the same time as everyone yeah. else. I don't think they're going to delay the thing, it. Is like, I think that once the Switch comes out and they see the architecture for it and they play around with it a bit, we'll see these games come out at the same time. I think the biggest problem was like, okay, well... Architecture we'll t- difference. Yeah, it's really easy to develop for the PS4 and the Xbox One because they're not that different in terms of how you build games and put them on them. Well, and what um, helps is that, um, you know, NVIDIA is apparently giving all the support. Yeah. So, like, native English speakers, you don't have to wait for translators and crappy emails from Japan <laughs> to get your support, which I, you know, I it, it sounds funny saying that, but, like, that's, if you listen to some of the third-party developers, especially Indies' complaints about Nintendo's support, it's not that Nintendo isn't, like, responding to them right away. They are. But ev- so much gets lost in translation mm-hmm. uh, that it's just, it's very poor communication. And whereas- Nintendo's always been hard to develop for. Because they've always tried to do their own architecture and their own sure. thing, which worked um, worked fine. Yeah, basically worked fine until the PlayStation came along. Yeah, and and, and that was that, that kind of set a, a yeah that kind of set like a different standard. Um, and now today the standard is oh everything's going you know, it's got to be like PC compatible. Um, yeah, even then that's a stretch because a lot of games that are coming out are broken on PC. Yeah, well that's because developer console first. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but like, like I'm saying, like for for indies, like I'd like to see games like Hyperlight Drifter and sure. Axiom Verge and stuff like that come out on the Switch when yeah, and I they think come they out will. on everything else. Yeah, and, and I ho- I hope they will. I think they will. Um, but I really hope that they have a more indie presence because, um, like Nintendo is like, oh yeah, we're focusing more on the independent develop- developers, but you know we got pushed back for Axiom Verge, which is essentially a new Metroid game, and. Nintendo, I think it was, was it at E3 where they just announced that they were going to put it on the Wii U? I think so, um, yeah. Finally. Yeah, and, and the only game that's really gotten consistent support on time has been Shovel Knight. <laughs> um, and that that series has been picked up, and, and Yacht Club Games is a lot bigger than it was when it started off. Um, so it, it, it'll be interesting to see how they handle it, especially with games like Stardew Valley coming um, to the Switch, which is a very indie niche game, but very much in the vein of what would be on a Nintendo console. Like it's it's, it's, it's kind of like Harvest Moon and, and a dungeon crawler. I, I I've been playing it nonstop <laughs> for the past few days. I've already clocked in like seventeen hours in it, which is slightly embarrassing. But <laughs> other than that, oh, no so idea. you know, what leak we talked about earlier. 
Which one? The data mining? Yeah, data mining one. It is uh, for Fire Emblem Mobile. Yeah. Remember, because remember how they were going to be a Fire Emblem game on phones? Mm-hmm. So it was some data that is in Mitomo too soon um, for Fire <laughs> Emblem. So uh, that's cool. I mean, I, I'm actually interested in what they're going to do with Fire Emblem on phones. Yeah. So, um, I'm very surprised what they're doing with Super Mario Run. I'm hoping it ends up being pretty good. Yeah, we got three days. Three days, guys. Well, it'll be Super out. <laughs> yeah. It'll be three out. Three days well, from today, which is the 12th. Yes. <laughs> it'll be out. It'll be out by the time you get this podcast. Pretty much. Pretty probably. much. Probably. Yeah. Oh, speaking of when you get this podcast, should we tell them what's happening next year? Uh, I don't know that we're going to have to rework uh, the timing for when we record and how we record. And yep. we're, we're going to solidify that um, more over the, the, the coming winter. Yeah, yeah, the coming weeks. Um, but because of my class schedule, like I'm going to be taking master's courses from on Monday nights from like 5.15 to, to 11 o'clock at night. Sure. Um, on Monday and Tuesday, so there's there's no time for me to record during those nights, and I don't want to make Nate try to record during the day. Um, so we're probably gonna record on like a Wednesday, um, and then push it out on a Thursday or Friday. Um, and also that gives us the opportunity to, when something like this hits on a Monday night, we don't have to like talk about it really quick. We can just recap the week of news, um, which would be really cool. Um, so we'll we'll play around with that a bit. There's we might toy with releasing this on. Um, you know, Wednesday or Friday. <coughs> ah, excuse me. Um, but we'll see. Uh, it just really depends on what Essentially, we um, for those listening, like, uh, you know, we, we've been pretty consistent with trying to get the podcast out every Wednesday. This is episode whatever yeah. it is. You know, almost getting close to episode 30. Um, like, we've been really good about hitting the Wednesdays. Uh, we hit them almost every time when I used to do the editing. We've hit them... Well, pretty pretty much most of the time when Alfred did. Um, uh, the the times that we didn't were due to the technical difficulties. Someone didn't get a video in time to us. Yeah. Um, or usually it's issue with the video version. The audio version is always really easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, video version does take a lot of work. And I appreciate you know I I think a lot of our our viewers and listeners, uh, especially on YouTube, really appreciate the video version. It gets almost as many views, uh, sometimes more views than our audio version does, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why it sucks that we didn't have a video version last week because you lost like half yeah. our viewership. But you know that that's fine. That things happen, and it's out of our control. I think it's better to release the podcast than continually delay it so we can do some fancy video stuff because we can't get our mm-hmm. cameras working. Um, especially since we have that awesome interview. Which, by yeah. the way, if you haven't listened to, it, like, go back and listen to last week's podcast. Skip like the first hour. And the last half hour of that is an interview with uh, was it Theophany from Theophany uh, and Mike Greer, uh, yeah. the guys that did the Times End film and the album. Yep, so, like, go, like, you know, let's say if you really enjoyed the animation and the album, uh, go, you know, listen to the interview. It's really good. Uh, but, yeah, like, <laughs> the Wednesday release probably isn't happening anymore because, as Alfred just said, we're probably going to end up recording on Wednesdays, uh, mm-hmm. so, which means we can't, pro- they're not doing same-day releases. <laughs> so, it it's also gives us more time, gives me more yeah. time to edit and, yeah. and, and refine So, things. basically, expect the podcast to probably come out Based on the current scheduling, we record on Mondays, release on Wednesdays. So you figure record on Wednesdays, release on Fridays. Um, you know, but we'll see. We haven't nailed down anything because it might even be where Saturday ends up being the best day. Mm-hmm. You know, it kind of work. It, it it's kind of up in the air till we get all the class stuff because I have classes too. I gotta sort that yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> when when we get that all sorted, we'll let you guys know. Uh, it'll probably we probably won't be able to let you know until like the first or second week in January if when mm-hmm. when we're, when we're actually gonna make the change. Um. So right Wait, now, this isn't really going to affect you guys yeah, that much. Yeah, we just want to kind of give you guys a heads up. That like, I know some of the podcasts lately have been late. Well, guess what? Um, that's the way it's going to be eventually. We just don't know exactly which day. But it still mm-hmm. will be released that week. Like, it'll be no later than Saturday. I can guarantee yeah. that. It's not a Sunday release. We're not delaying. We're not recording on Wednesday to release on Monday. Like, no, that's not happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, like, it's, it's just either going to be Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. We hope you understand and appreciate. We're trying to make this fit around our busy lives. Yeah. Um, like, the reason he doesn't want to do it during the day for me, uh, yeah, sure, I work at the sites during the day, but I have all of my kids during the day, which makes it really hard. Um, mm-hmm. Unless we want to make a special kid podcast. Which, <laughs> Alfred, you got to go get some kids. Uh, I got, uh, give me a little time. Right, give me a few years on that one. Ah, you could adopt. They're, then they're age ready already. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I had the money to do that, I'd have the money for a better video camera. <laughs> 
if you had the money to do that, you probably wouldn't be doing this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> to be to be honest, I only do this. Well, I do this because I'm passionate about it. But you know, I, be, if I didn't make money doing this, I probably wouldn't be doing it. To be honest, I do this. Yeah, this is just a passion project for me. I don't get paid at all. Yeah, like, like I would still probably do the podcast, but like all the other stuff I do. Oh my god, I have 400 business emails in my Zelda Informer email right now. I have to answer <laughs> tonight. Um, yeah. Hence, we wanted to record this podcast a little earlier than usual. Anyways, yeah. I think that's I think that's gonna wrap it up. Yeah, I think that's all we got. Oh, uh, thanks for tuning in this week. We finally got the time of it slightly below an hour and a half, so that's good. Yeah, and we we got in a bunch of stuff. Finally hit that giant email. So, yeah, if you have any more fan topics and stuff, you can always send it to podcast at zeldainformer dot com. Um, we don't get a lot of stuff sent there, but. Uh, it's a good, that's the way to get a hold of us more directly. Like, if you want to get a hold of Alfred, I, uh, literally, I'll forward it right from that email to his inbox. I won't even read it if you put, like, Alfred in the subject. Because um, <laughs> it's for him, not for me. Uh, for me, you can email me there. Obviously, I have a public email, too. But, um, like, if you, it's podcast-specific, like, don't send it to my business email. I'm probably going to ignore it if it's podcast-specific, <laughs> to be honest. I have so much other stuff going on in there. I don't, I don't need... That's why the podcast email exists. It, keep that stuff away. <laughs> yeah. All right. So thanks. submit it on Twitter, yeah. Facebook, yeah, podcast Twitter, Facebook. email, uh, or YouTube. We're on, we're on Google Plus and Tumblr too, although we don't really ask for much on Google Plus and Tumblr. <laughs> but hey, we're there. Maybe one time we'll randomly check and be like, uh, look, we have 17 fan topics from Tumblr today. Yeah. Um, anyways. Thanks for tuning in. Yep. See you guys later. See you next week.